So over the years, we've done a lot of um, a lot of things to the product, um, and particularly in terms of the bringing together content from different sources. And the kind of history in this here is is mapped together quite well. So since 2013, we had already started bringing content from other systems into the delivery platform. So we had storage extensions, so you could write your own ones for that. We had ADF, if anyone's familiar with that, that was allowing you to write custom cartridges to bring in content and merge it together at the delivery side. And then in 2017, we built the, the current digital experience delivery platform as it is today, um, which supported docs and sites, which is why we're hearing about Trillion DX, and you've been hearing that today. And we've been kind of refining that over the last couple of years, and with the, the latest release in Pretty Insights 9.1, which is supported by DXD 11.1. This is when we're bringing together even more points to bring together some of these content. So in this current release, there's some of the new bits we've already heard about today is the add-on service, which allows us to dynamically bring in connectors and other extension points into both content management and content delivery. There's also the integration framework that Evo showed us earlier, which allows you to build .NET and Java connectors and deploy them on both content management and on content delivery side. Um, other things we've done for those that are interested, if we've introduced Elasticsearch 6 support, so this is key for Trillion Docs customers because we were lagging behind in the Trillion Sites 9 release and that on the support for Elastic. And we use Elastic not just in Trillion Docs search, but also within Trillion Sites in our experience optimization um, system. And we did some platform updates as well. So specifically Oracle 11, um, JDK 11 on, and on Adopt JDK 11. We had .NET Framework 4.8, uh, a couple of the latest Windows server operating systems, latest Red Hat Linux, um, latest databases on Oracle and SQL Server. So I want to talk a little bit about the Content Hub. So this again is just really thinking about all the things we've heard today about bringing together content from different sources. So the key part to our dynamic experience delivery piece is we have these two content management systems already, so we can already start to leverage these two pieces of content and get them into our, into our platform. And then the connectors, of course, now opens up a whole new world of areas that we can bring together content from external systems. Well, we obviously want to then expose these to customers in different ways. So traditionally, DXA is our digital, digital experience accelerator uh, framework, if you like, for building web applications. That's how customers of sites, and even docs more recently, have been using um, getting content out of the system. But more recently, people have been asking, asking us to build native interfaces on top of our services, the so-called headless way of working. And that then opens up scope for third-party integrations. So if you don't want to use our web app or you don't want to build a, a web client, you can still use client tools to talk to our service. And you know, if you want to build your own CMS on top of it, perhaps, because that's quite a common use case, we still find. So. so a brief bit about the architecture. I'm not going to go into too much detail, just a quick, quick overview, if you like, for those that don't know it. So I've got discovery services. There are um, capability registration um, so essentially all of our services talk to that discovery service and if any other service wants to know where those other services are, you ask the discovery service, it tells you where they are. There's also a token service in that because all of our services do have um, authentication on them, so um, security on them, so we have a token service sitting in there because we deploy it with all those pieces. Uh, just going along down the bottom here, we've got the index and the query service sort of put by Elastic in the middle there. So that's really for Trillion Docs search and for our experience optimization, which is the one showing you a little bit further down here. So XO is our prescriptive personalization. So it's a rules-based um, personalization ASIN engine that you can use within Trillion Sites to kind of ta to tailor the content you're getting out at the end. Going further down, we've got the context services here. So what they are, that's a context service is a, a device repository that contains several thousand device details about mobile phones, tablets, 
all the different manufacturers, and it's kind of the, the, the various details of properties on those devices that we then expose as a, as a service that um, web application developers can use. So it's kind of taking what you can do in responsive, you can go so far, but there's certain other things you, you can't find out from a responsive design, so this is why we have this device repository. Sitting next to it is CID, which is our cons contextual image delivery. So this is a, a real-time image transformation service that allows you to change, given a, a, a URL and some rules, you can change a, a source image to any size you want, crop it, scale it, trim it, whatever you want to do. And then the, the service will deliver that scaled image. And then future requests with that same request, obviously, will return a cached version of the image. So the key benefit there is that you only need to single source your images. You can have one, one image, and then all your service, um, all your different devices can you know, get images and stuff that are the right size for it. So those last two are often used together. And then finally, on, these two, on this diagram here, we've got the audience manager. And that is um, it's our audience contact management and synchronization stuff. And then finally, on there, at the bottom, which you can't see, is UGC, which is our user-generated user content, which is ratings and um, comments that you can add to your content. And that's one of the few, you'll see the little arrow there pointing backwards down at the bottom there. That's one of our few writable services that we have within our platform. So that actually allows web application developers to contrib contribute back into our platform. So that's the architecture. On the right, briefly, we have our web applications. This is web applications as it is today, where we, as I say, we provide this DXA framework that you can use to build web applications. And that is in either .NET or Java. Um, I'll talk about GraphQL in a minute. And sitting at the bottom there is the dynamic documentation module that Dave referred to in his previous thing, that those were here, those that were here. So there's a bit of DXA runs, a bit of docs to support the React-based client web application. So today, I really want to talk about this layer, and most importantly, this bit over here, so our content service. So we've heard, heard today quite a lot, and you've seen some demos around GraphQL, and I'm going to kind of reiterate some of that today. So the key thing to our content service is it's our primary content delivery piece for the platform. Um, it takes content from our deployer, which is our primary dog co content ingestion service. And as you can see on the left, it's taken it from don't need to zoom on there, quite frankly. It's taken it from our um, Trillion Sites and Trillion Docs. They send our content into our deployer. That packages it up together into a format that our platform understands in our various storage layers. And then our content service is the one that's capable of delivering it. These are all microservices, so they scale in much the same way that any microservice can be scaled and put together. You'll see the add-on service sitting over on the left there, sitting outside a little bit, the kind of the layers of services that we had. Um, Evo mentioned there that we're having this concept of a set of common services that both CM and CD can use, which is why we kind of hone it off in its own little piece. But you'd secure it however you needed to, to make, it, make it sense for that. But the reason that we have it there is because both the CM side obviously needs to talk to it, and from our side in the DXD platform, we've got the deployer and the content service using that add-on service. And I'll talk briefly around that in a minute. So I talked about GraphQL earlier and what it is and why it is we built this. So GraphQL, for those that don't know, it was um, the API that Facebook built to support Facebook back in 2012. So when they reworked it to get a new service, they developed this API. And they open sourced it in 2015. So we were looking around a few years back about, you know, we had this legacy API that was a bit kind of creaking at the seams, and we're looking at what it is that people needed to, to get a, a nice API to interact with our service. And we thought, well, we could just build more REST APIs again. REST are nice and clean, well documented. But at the time, it was um, because of the sort of things that customers were building with their web applications, you could, the sort of number of REST APIs you'd have to build to support that, it started being in, you know, you'd have loads and loads of endpoints you'd have to maintain, and then you have to version them, because we've got a whole series of history of um, product releases to support. And this is where GraphQL comes in really nicely, because it's uh, uh, an API that allows you to do, um, you don't over or under fetch. So we talk about query efficiency, query efficiency here. Essentially, you ask it for what you want, and that's what you get back. You don't get extra data that you have to disregard. So that's good in terms of the size of the data you're getting from your service. Also, it allows you to um, do single trip requests. So you can basically ask for everything you want. 
in one request and it will all come back in one piece. That has its ups and downsides because rather than lots and lots of small REST requests that you might get with a typical REST service, with GraphQL you typically have one larger request with one piece back. So it's, you've got to rethink slightly how you do caching and things like that with it, but it is more efficient in terms of chattiness. So a good example was our old DXA service for those that are still using the old CIL service. You know, typically you might be doing 40, 50 requests to the content service in order to get the content from the system. And that obviously has its overhead because you're doing authentication all kinds during that, that, that communication. So GraphQL is perfect for that. Um, it's really nice to use, so there's a huge community behind it. So because it's a specification and Facebook obviously had its roots in there, there are client tools for pretty much any computer language you care to think of. And there's some good links that I can share in these slides if we do share them for those that are interested. Um, so if you want to build a, I mean, out of the box, you know, we're sh in DXA, we're shipping a, a Java and a .NET client GraphQL already. But you can build JavaScript ones, you can build them in Scala, you can build them in, I don't know, Prolog, all kinds of things that I suspect. So. <laughs> um, and the nice thing also is the, the backend stability. Because the, the way that the services are um, on the endpoints are defined in GraphQL, essentially you define queries, and you can then, if you want to improve your your service going forward, you can just create either a new query or you can augment that query with extra functionality and your existing queries can remain the same. So backward compatibility, you don't have to version the whole endpoint, you just have one endpoint um, and you can build upon it like that. You can obviously use it to wrap REST APIs as well, which is quite a common use case actually. And if you look out in the world, you get a lot of people building GraphQL um, API gateways essentially, because it's a nice way of bringing together um, APIs under one endpoint. And the reason for that is because there's this concept of a, a data model sitting underneath everything in GraphQL. So with GraphQL, you define a schema which defines a data model that is exposed to that API endpoint. That can be a really meaningful schema to your end user. And then that makes it really easy to query and really easy for developers to use and build upon. Uh, self-documenting, so a lot of REST APIs are in fact, so if you look at Swagger and OpenAPI, they're also self-documenting, -doc um, but it's really, really useful again if you are an application developer and you're trying to learn your way around this system. You probably saw Evo earlier doing kind of tab completion in the GraphQL client. It just tells you what's there, you don't have to go and look it up or anything like that. So mashups. So I'm talking about mashups because you heard it earlier from, or you probably saw it in um, Arian's slide this morning, the, the very same slightly adjusted color scheme. Arian didn't like the scheme, he said it hurt his eyes, but I was trying to do the whole matrix theme throughout this presentation. So there's the red and blue. I don't know whether that's good for docs, whether the red pill is good for docs or not. <laughs> Who knows? So. I probably kind of want a bit of a mix of the two. But yes, so essentially the way our mashups works is we have our Trillion Sites content manager, we have our Trillion Docs content manager, the Trillion Sites Content Manager exposes a taxonomy. So you define that, set it up, build it. Trillion Docs talks to that taxonomy using the metadata binding provider, and Dave touched on that earlier as well. Um, you then publish both systems independently into our DXD platform, and that allows you then to bring both of the content in a single database. Our DXD platform is Oracle, it's SQL Server, it's MySQL as well in our own cloud. We haven't released that publicly, but essentially we have one data source with all our content in. Um, each data source has its own namespace, is the concept of a namespace. So we can uniquely identify content from each source. The reason we have that namespace is because the IDs for the content within DXD are generated from the content management systems. So you could end up with two IDs coming from two different systems being the same. So you've got to differentiate them somehow. The namespace kind of continues as well into the connected world as well. So the whole namespace theme kind of trickles along th through that piece as well. And that's all exposed through, the, through our platform and through our content API. And then in order to get that data out, we've built some little um, extensions within our DXA web application that allows you to quickly query this, this combined mashed up content. You can do it yourself natively, and I'll show you that a little bit. Um, or you can use the module that we provide out the box to do quick integrations and do nice little mashups. And then finally, you can build your web page and obviously you can put on there whatever you need from both systems. So integration framework. Again, hopefully if you, if you were around for Evo's thing, you'll be familiar with this. 
So I'm just talking here about the dxd side of the equation here. So within that, we have the content, the connector manager piece, and we've packaged that up as, as an extension. So that sits within our content manager. Um, it loads, it talks to the add-on service that we were talking about earlier. Uh, so when you start up these services, it finds out which add-ons, which connectors you've configured for this content management, content delivery service. Um, and then the connector manager is responsible for spinning these up when you make these requests. And again, this is a Java and .NET, so it doesn't matter what technology you build these connectors in, you can do it in our content delivery platform, which is written in Java. So it kind of takes away some of the boundaries you had before. You heard before about the connectors. We have a connector team building various connectors. So we've got the Salesforce and the Hybris ones already, and we're building some other ones. And I suspect some of the names here, the sort of things you'd imagine being moved across to the new framework as we go forward. Then the add-on service. So again, this is something that Eva touched on earlier. So again, just focusing on how the DXD service uses these. So we have um, a number of connectors, or not connectors, extensions that we use within our platform. So we use the add-on service not just for delivering connectors, but we also use it for configuring um, all the various bits you can plug into our platform. So we use this ourselves in our cloud release because obviously that makes it really easy for us to deploy our stuff. Um, but also on-premise, you can deploy this as well. You deploy your own on-premise add-on service. And then rather than having to copy files and jars and configuration files around, you just download your zip, add a bit of configuration to it if you need to, which is only a few of the services need that. And then our various two services that make use of them can use that connector, sorry, use that extension. And as you see on the, the right hand side here, these are the kind of standard extensions that we ship with the product on the content service side. And on the left hand side, these are the deployer service extensions that we have. So we've got this kind of add on service that's supporting the connector framework, which is then supporting the whole um, mashups and it's supporting the, the, the combined content hub idea. So I was going to do a quick, quick run through of some, some queries. I think we're all right for time for another 10 minutes. I know you guys will want to get out to happy hour. Let me just stop this a minute. I'll just need to refresh this a minute. Obviously, our services are secured, so I need a, a fresh token to talk to them. And I'll just inject that in here. OK, so you can see this add-on service has been configured with all kinds of extensions in here. The one that's of interest, I guess, is the Salesforce one at the bottom here, which I plugged in a couple of days ago. And then this is the the GraphQL queries that we were talking about earlier. So again, Evo's run through some examples on this. I've got a few here I'm going to go through just to give you an idea of the sort of flexibility that GraphQL allows you to do and how you might bring together content from sites and docs and through the connectors into, into, into your output. So it's sort of quite a techy, low-level stuff. I'm only showing you the, the output sort of from JSON from the service. Obviously, typically customers would build a web application on top and deliver something meaning, meaningful for end users. But this is what we can talk to directly. So this first sample here, I'll just show you briefly some of the, the kind of root queries we have. So we have within our schema, we've got a couple of root queries. We've got the content query, and within that are all these root queries down here. So these expose various Tridian concepts, um, things like pages and components, component presentations for those that are familiar with um, Tridian sites content. We have categories and keywords, those are exposed as well. And this particular example is just a, a simple, simple query where we're just doing generic, get me some items of stuff. In this case, they're pages. Um, you see the namespace here. This, in this case, I'm asking for Tridian site stuff. So I'm just using the unique ID for that namespace. And I'm asking for, um, can you give me these items, sites items that have this category within them? And then underneath here, this little piece here, this, what this is actually doing is converting the content that we have within our service to what we call an R2 data model, which is a DXA-specific representation of our data. Um, it just 
gives you a, an idea that we have a different way of representing data within the output. But the key thing here is we're asking for, in the response, we want the item ID, the title, and for pages of the type of uh, these items. We want the metadata of those pages. And in this case, we just want to dump out the raw content. So this will give us everything from that page that sits within the, the content itself. And the nice thing about GraphQL is but essentially whatever you type on your query is pretty much what you get on the output. So you, you know, it's, it's not like a completely different uh, world of data that you've got to deal with coming out. So you can see in this example here, I've got um, a couple of uh, entries in this sites instance that have got this navigation keyword um, that are products within here that have a, a particular navigation keyword. And in this case, there's a, there's a couple in here. And the thing to, to note on this one in particular, uh, um, if you look under this red bike here, there's some Bear with me a moment. So you, anyway, you can see you can see oh this is what I was after here. So you can see here there's this this hook here that we have, which is our um, hook that we have to the taxonomy within Tridian Docs. So it has this 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 ID of three eight six here. So this is this is where this is the site side we're looking at here still. If you know the ID, you can do the same query directly on the the ID itself. So in this case, we're no longer doing a query based on a, a keyword. And in this case, it's a specific item coming back. And again, I'm getting that same red bike back in the in the response. So now in this example, let me just hide that so you can see what I'm doing here. So in this case, we know now this, this, this category that we want to filter on from the docs side of things. This is content I'm now looking for for the docs content that's been published in this instance. And you know that I'm looking for docs content, docs topics basically, because I've got a, a, a namespace ID of two here. And I'm asking for give me all the docs content that has the matching um, category within this, which was 378 from our category over here. And then where the keyword itself matches this value, which is where, so I should probably show you the um, docs here. So we've actually got this, this entry within docs. And within there, you can see it's been tagged using the taxonomy connector onto. So this is a, a Trillion Sites taxonomy that's been hooked into the, the docs content. And that's then assigned to this content. And then when I query this, I should get back that item of content as it's been published into DXD. And if you um, delve down into this, you should see that same reference in the, in the metadata. Uh, so you can see is the content body there, which is obviously in this topic, it's, it's a chunk of HTML. So the metadata is up here. Here we go. So that's an example of bringing together, getting docs content based upon some classification on the site side of things. And you can again, you can you can do the same kind of transformations on it. So in this case, I want to transform the data again into that DXA R two model, which can then be consumed by DXA at the other side. So now we've got a, a list of publications. So another query again, it's. I just want to find out which publications have got this. Again, docs, docs publications in this case. Um, just give me a result on them. And again, you can have whatever fields are available on that, on that publication data. Like you can get it dragged out within here. So briefly back to the namespaces. So Evo touched on the um, connectors and how we can hook in the content API onto external data sources. 
So in this example you saw earlier that had Salesforce CRM connector configured. Um, and then another good example, I've got, a, got an ID that I want to get a specific contact back from Salesforce. So this is a, a sample query that you might use for that. You'll see this edges notion quite a lot in a lot of our samples. And what that is, it's a, a standard mechanism within GraphQL that allows you to do cursor-based pagination. So rather than the sort of traditional pagination, where we might have 1 to 99 and then 100 to 199, cursor-based means you get to the end of it, and then it gives you a pointer to the next one in the list. And the reason that works well is because if data changes whilst you're scrolling through a whole series of pages, it means you don't get gaps in your content or your gaps in your kind of page numbers. So that's a standard feature of um, GraphQL, and it's something with all of our kind of list returns typically support pagination on there. So I'll just do one more um, example, and that's I will create a contact, because we did talk about um, how do you actually create content in here. So there's this concept of mutations within GraphQL, which is essentially a write operation. And for a, a content service that's been appropriately secured, so obviously you wouldn't necessarily open this to the world, you can, um, you can create entities in your connected data sources, as long as those data sources have writable operations on them. So for instance, I can put in um, and create a contact here. Uh, I have Mark Twain, right? And then that creates, goes off to Salesforce, creates a contact, gives us an ID back, and then clearly I can use that for subsequent queries if I wanted to um, get an item again. So uh, let's find another example query. I've lost one. There we go. So if I put in, it digs me out of the system. So again, just so brief, a brief overview that this connector framework allows you to do more than just retrieving data. Um, one final thing I was going to show was about how you can bring together content in a single query from multiple bits. So this example here is pulling together a, a request from the connector, and at the same time it's pulling together a request on, in this case it's a, a sites request. These are just labels, these things here, and in the results you get these sections broken down into manageable pieces. So again, it's just a nice way of easily using the interface to, to kind of build your web applications or your, your, your um, client applications or whatever it is. So that was what I was going to show you on the demo. Um, I've got a couple more slides and then we're done. And then you can go and have tea. So what have we got coming up? So obviously, we've already heard from Evo that the connector team are building more connectors for us. So that should be open the world to us to more integrations. Um, we're doing search for sites. So we've had search for docs since 10.0. Um, we do have an option for sites today. You can do search, but it's an open source plugin called si for t that you have to use and integrate yourself. So what we're doing is using our experience of working with Elasticsearch, because that's what underpins our current search engine. We're building a, a, an out-of-the-box search solution for sites. And the other big area that we're focusing on is a, a new DXA. So there's various kind of streams to this, but the key thing is right now DXA is a Java application and it's a .NET web application. And it has quite a lot of business logic embedded in that. It was exposing, you saw probably some of the complexity of some of the queries I was exposing earlier in terms of the, the data model, that's currently being exposed at the web application level. And it doesn't really make sense to do it though, we should do it in the content service. So as part of the new DXA work, we're bringing together this whole semantic data model into the content service so that we can then, a bit like in the connectors, you can have much more kind of meaningful um, discussions with how you get your content out of your content service. Because you'll then be able to essentially define a schema for your content models um, that might be the same as your schema within Trillion Sites, or it might be a completely different schema, or it might be a, a mix of the two. You load that into your service, and then you can query GraphQL natively using that schema that you've defined, so it's the customer's own data model, and then it just makes it even more um, flexible to use. So that's what's coming up, but that's for another year. And then finally, as, a, as I say, my team is Kiev and Amsterdam. This is my 
some of my current team. <laughs> That's it.